Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Okay, well, welcome back from lunch. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the d uh, d Dutch hospitality, sandwiches. <laughs> uh, exactly. Being British, I loved it. Um, so I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Itan Bar Barms. Nearly got that wrong. <laughs> Itan Barms, he's the capability lead uh, at Deloitte. Uh, in the quantum security, uh, in cryptography and quantum security in Deloitte Risk Advisory. And his team um, provide advice and support and implementation for PKI, key management, cryptography, uh, and of course, mitigating the quantum threat. He's a subject matter expert and served uh, as the subject matter expert on the World Economic Forum uh, for Quantum Security. And he regularly writes articles on thought leadership for uh, quantum and cryptography in general. So uh, without any further uh, introduction, Itan, please take it away. Thank you. I usually get the slot just before lunch, and I see how people are sitting there just waiting for me to finish uh, so they can run for lunch. Uh, so I really like it. I, there is no excuse for you to run away now. <clears throat> um, so my name is Tom Vermes, I'm from Deloitte, and I, I am a consultant. So my job is to advise my clients on a lot of different cybersecurity uh, issues, uh, and now these days also on quantum security. And the question that I always get when I talk about this topic is, when is this, is this going to happen? Right? When is the sky going to fall? Um, <clears throat> and when do we need to do something about this? So as you can see from the title of this presentation, it's not about when it's going to happen. And the reason for that is, um, we don't know. There are all kinds of estimates and guesses, and uh, uh, Mikhail Lomoska has done uh, really interesting research on when people think that this is going to come, but we just don't know. And in my opinion, trying to answer this question of when this is going to happen uh, is counterproductive, because we don't know, um, and as you know, a lot of professionals here that work in uh, risk management, Risk management is not about uh, certainties, it's about how you, how you deal with uncertainties. So instead of talking about the when, I think it's helpful to talk about what is actually, what needs to happen before, before it happens. So talking about the milestones. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> so me and, uh, and a couple of colleagues and friends uh, have built a very simple, simple model uh, how to think about this. So to talk a little bit more about the motivation, why? And this is, this is a, a confusing topic. You know, it's about physics and math and a lot of stuff that uh, information security professionals are not used to talk about uh, and don't like to talk about. And if you're like me uh, on LinkedIn, see regularly, sometimes on a weekly basis, these big announcements, RSA is broken. Um, I get a lot of questions about that, and it takes a lot of my time. Uh, so I thought, why not try to educate people a little bit about next time that you see something like this, to understand a little bit more what this is about and how, how much merit is there to uh, these kind of claims. So it's a simple model, four steps, <coughs> divided into two parts. So the first two, we start at the bottom, the algorithm layer, uh, the logical layer, this is more the math and uh, you know, what you can do on a piece of paper. Uh, not that that's, that's easy. Um, and then moving to the real world. Now, how do we actually implement this and what, what do we need to have uh, before these computers are big enough and powerful enough to actually do some damage? 
Anyone not familiar with this uh, equation? Right. <clears throat> so we all know that uh, public key cryptography, and specifically RSA, is a good cryptography algorithm because the factorization problem is difficult. If you take two prime numbers, even if they're very large, uh, you can multiply them, it's easy, you get the product. The other way is very difficult. So if you give you a very large integer, break it into its prime factors, is very difficult. And if you find an algorithm uh, that solves it in an easy way, then it's broken. And we know that in 1994, Peter Shor came up with a uh, quantum algorithm to make that problem easy uh, on the way back. Does anyone here know how Peter Shor, Shor solved this? I won't put you on the spot to actually explain it. Uh, a couple, okay. So there is a big misconception by a lot of people. Uh, if you heard about uh, quantum computers a little bit, you have heard things like quantum parallelism, uh, that quantum computers can do many things at the same time, which is not really true. And then when people see this, they say, okay, so you just try a lot of prime numbers and you can try a lot of them in parallel and then you find, uh, you find the integer. So you do it uh, reversely. That is not true. So I would comp absolutely recommend to all of you to read Shor's paper. It's beautiful and it's genius. Uh, but what Peter Shor did, he actually solved a very different problem. So the one here at the top. So if you have a periodic function, don't worry, no uh, difficult equations or anything like that. If you have a, a periodic function, then finding the period of this function uh, if this function here it's very easy, but for a very large function that's difficult. Uh, and that problem is actually equivalent. So this problem you can uh, transform into this problem. And if you can solve this one, which is exactly what Peter Shor did, you can also solve this one. So Peter Shor's work is, as I said, genius. And again, very much recommended, although it's pretty tough. Um, <clears throat> that's what he did. But the way he did it is it's basically math. So um, it wasn't ready. So if there was a large enough quantum computer back then when he, uh, uh, when he came up with this algorithm, uh, it wouldn't be translated one to one from the algorithm to actually doing it. And that is the algorithm the layer. It's um, uh, what he showed was beautiful and very, uh, well, not really helpful, but, uh, um, you need to do another step before you can actually implement it. And that is the logical layer. So here is something that is much more recognizable as something that a computer does. Um, if you have done any uh, computer science in, in high school, uh, you've seen logical gates, OR and XOR and 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 all that stuff. In the period after um, Shor invented this algorithm, a lot of people started working on uh, basically building the, the instruction set for a quantum computer, okay? The, um, building something that you can speak the language of a quantum computer in order to uh, actually run these algorithms. And this is Shor's algorithm in, uh, in its logical form. For if people know here a little bit, then you might recognize the quantum Fourier transform, and this is modular exponentiation. If you don't, that's, that's fine. <clears throat> um, the interesting thing here, is that there is no one way to implement Shor's algorithm. Uh, you can, um, maybe to give an analogy, you can, you can speak it in different languages, right? And the way, just an example, to take this big block, um, there are different ways to actually take uh, the small building blocks and build, and build this thing. And you, I imagine you all heard about qubits, the, the fundamental uh, units of quantum information. You can build all these components in different ways. So you can do it in ways that use more qubits, uh, but you need less operations to do it. You can do it the other way around. There are a lot of parameters there. And that's on itself is a kind of a, an optimization problem. <coughs> so, um, you can do it in different ways. Uh, so why would you choose one or the other? When you're on this level, the logical layer, uh, then there's not necessarily a reason 
I mean, it depends on your resources. Do you have more qubits? Do you have, uh, are they more stable so you can run them for a long time? Um, it's, still, it's still a mathematical problem. It's not really in, in real life. Um, and as we will see in the next level, there are, uh, there are big trade-offs. Like if you um, just use just a few less qubits, uh, but then um, uh, you need to run it for a much longer time, or you even need to use specific logic gates that are much more difficult to actually implement in real life, uh, that has a big impact. Still on paper. Now we come to the real world. So <clears throat> the qubits that Peter Shore talked about and uh, the ones that we, you know, when you see this sphere, the, the, the Bloch sphere and the, the one and zero and at the same time, um, that is a, a mathematical construct. And I won't get into a qubit and exactly what it is. Um, it is a fact that realizing a qubit in the lab is much more difficult than just writing the equation on paper and extremely more difficult. So a qubit can be a spin of an electron or an ion or many different things. Um, and to get them stable in, in an actual lab uh, is very difficult. So if they are noisy and we, you know, that they mess up our calculations, uh, we need to correct for these errors. And I'm pretty sure that most people here have heard of, of error correction. So just uh, in a classical sense, what is error correction? Let's say you want to transmit a bit, classical bit of information from point A to B. Uh, if you're communication channel is noisy, you can just copy it three times and send all three. Uh, and if the noise level is below a specific threshold, then at least two are going to be uh, stay the same. Uh, only one is going to flip. Then you know, you read it on the other side, and you know the, uh, the information. If the noise, le no noise level increases, you just copy it more, more times and you'll be fine. That doesn't work for quantum computers. And it doesn't work for uh, um, a very big problem that is called the non-cloning theorem. So in normal computing, uh, you know, we can just copy information from one place to the other. We have two copies. That is impossible. And that's not impossible technically. That is impossible from the laws of physics. So when you think about quantum algorithms and how we do calculations, um, one very fundamental thing that we do in computing is inaccessible to us. So what I said about error correction and how you, uh, you know, copy information and then send it, that, that, that is impossible. So we need to completely reinvent the way we do error correction. And a lot of people are working on it uh, and have been working on it for a long time. Um, it's that the penalty that, we, that, that you pay for it is, is pretty big. So just, just to give an example, this is uh, an image or uh, a drawing of the Google Sycamore uh, chip. You see here 72 um, qubits. Uh, you see the connection between them. They can interact with each other uh, with what we call nearest neighbor interactions. <coughs> I won't get into too much detail. Um, the translation from these logical qubits that we, uh, we had in Shor's algorithm to do them in real life with uh, correcting all these errors, you basically combine um, multiple, what we call physical qubits, into uh, a single logical qubit. And this was, I think about a year ago, the first dem dem demonstration of uh, error correction. So here you see this, this is a collection of physical qubits uh, that creates one logical qubit. Uh, kind of a funny note about this demonstration, the error levels that they achieved here is worse than the physical qubit itself. So there is no improvement in real error correction. This was just a demonstration to show that this was one logical qubit and then they, they did one with you know, a larger logic, logical qubit, uh, that the error level uh, improves when you increase the size. Right, so, and if you had million, uh, then you will see you will get better and better. But it's really far from from doing anything useful. <coughs> As a first demonstration, amazing, really important work. The very first dem demonstration of uh, of uh, kind of scalable error correction. 
really far away from what we need. Um, so just a, a bit of estimations in the previous slide with uh, on the logical level, how many qubits do we need to actually uh, run Scholes al algorithm, logical qubits? Uh, again, as I said, there are different ways to do it. It's to break 2048-bit uh, uh, RSA key. You need between 4,000 and 12,000 logical qubits. How does that translate here? Um, the, the estimates that people have is about one to one to thousand, right? So, few thousand logical qubits. That would be millions to maybe tens or maybe hundreds of millions. We have 72. Uh, well, we since then we have 433, and from last week uh, there is a, um, a quantum computer with a thousand qubits, but still it's a you know, it's, it's still a very big difference. So this error correction is a really important. It's so important that it in our model got uh, its own level, uh, and something that we are still need to do a lot of work uh, to even get close to actually doing something useful with it. So we can do something better with error correction than without. And if that is not enough, even if we, uh, we get I don't know, thousands or millions of, uh, of qubits, uh, then there's the architecture layer. And there is really a lot to say here, and I will just scratch the surface. Um, first of all, a very quick comparison, uh, IBM and Google. Um, you see that the architecture looks very different. These are all, by the way, uh, superconducting qubits. Uh, these are small loops of, uh, uh, that runs current through them. doesn't matter. It can be uh, like a qubit needs to be 0, 1, or anything in between. But you see here that the connections are nearest neighbor, and uh, the IBM chip uh, it's different. So all the, what, what I talked about in the logical layer, the, the instruction set, the, how these computers, um, the, the language that they speak, uh, would be different here and here. And that can have impact on, for example, uh, error correction. So the, the way this logical qubit is constructed and worked with, it's not going to work here because you don't have the, the right interactions. So this is one thing, and this is just um, between two chips that are very similar, both superconducting qubits. These chips, I don't know if, if you've ever seen the, the, the IBM quantum computer, this big chandelier with uh, the illusion refrigerator, it's, it's a big thing with just tens of qubits. <clears throat> there will be a limit to how many of these qubits we can put on, on one chip. Um, just you know, physical limits. The way people think that we will get to the, the millions of qubits that we need is going to have separate chips and connect them. This is what is called in interconnects. Um, it's a problem that a lot of people are working on it. I, I haven't seen so far anything that is even close to understanding how these things will work. We, we need to invent a lot of physics and then the engineering to, to actually make this work. So even if you find a way to have a million qubits, then connect them, connecting them between different chips, that's, uh, that's, that's a whole uh, thing on itself. And then just to, get, to give a little bit of a science fiction taste to it, um, in other modality, not these uh, superconducting qubits. There are ideas how to take uh, qubits and use shuttling to move them around. So if you want interaction between this qubit and, and this qubit, uh, you can mediate interactions through others, or in this case, you can move them around. It, it's, to me, it's, uh, it, it's mind-blowing. There are some demonstrations of this. These are all ways uh, to find a smart way, you know, the best way you can in order to, uh, uh, to create these interactions because uh, here, if you need to, if you want to interact between this qubit and this qubit, all the steps in between, um, the, the, the penalty is so heavy that the uh, algorithm might work, but we will lose all the, um, uh, you know, the fact that Schor's algorithm is polynomial instead of uh, exponential you might lose all the advantage because of this. So these are all examples of problems that 
need to be solved before we even get close to implementing something like this. Knowing that we need millions and millions of, uh, of these qubits. <coughs> so that's why a lot of people uh, are comparing where we are now in quantum computer, quantum computing to, uh, to the, the 1940s. For us, for at least, uh, at least for myself, we grew into the, the computing world with silicon being the, you know, the, the winning uh, technology to, to build chips. Uh, but before that time, there was a whole period that people were looking for the, the way to scale up computing, right? We are at this phase. Uh, the, these superconducting qubits that IBM and Google are using, uh, there are others. Uh, there are many different ways to build qubits. Uh, which one of them is scalable, stable, uh, cheap? Uh, all these things, that's still unknown. And each one of them has advantages and disadvantages, and we are still not sure which one is going to scale up. So just, just to give an example, people are usually looking at um, uh, IBM and Google. Um, if you've heard of IronQ using um, ions, um, there was a publication, I think it was last week, by Atom Computing, the big breakthrough, uh, passing the 1,000 qubit, uh, it's not a chip, but uh, processor. That one is using neutral atoms. It's, uh, there, is, there is not even a way to compare these things. It's completely different. So if you, if you hear about a new chip or a new something that has more qubits, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's doesn't even necessarily mean that it's better. Uh, in this specific context, it doesn't mean that we're getting even closer to uh, implementing Shor's algorithm. I'm realizing that I'm being very negative about this. It's just really, really difficult. Okay, so what do we expect? So I said that I'm, I, I, I always avoid the question of when this is going to happen. Uh, and I generally avoid any question of making any predictions. So this is your lucky day. I'm going to try to make a prediction with a big disclaimer. On each level, what do we expect to happen? Please don't record this. <clears throat> On the algorithm layer, um, I gave an example of Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm is just a specific algorithm, right? Um, some of the recent announcements, or basically all the recent annou announcements on big breakthrough breakthroughs are in methods that are not sure. Uh, now it comes, my prediction, this is all speculative. I have never seen anything uh, that I would even consider serious in breaking cryptography with a quantum algorithm that is not sure as the algorithm. Is the probability zero of this ever happening? No, because nothing is 0% uh, probability. But uh, can, you, can you do your risk management by just making speculations? My personal opinion is no. So I don't expect anything outside of shore to be meaningful on this layer. If you invite me next year, maybe I'll, be, uh, I'll stand here and uh, stand corrected. On the logical layer, this is really important and this is something a lot of people don't know. There's a lot of work being done on this uh, and a lot of progress. There was one specific, uh, very interesting publication, I think about two years ago, that showed that you can, <coughs> um, looking at the, the biggest bottleneck of this whole thing, which is there are specific uh, operations in quantum computer that are very, very expensive to make. And they showed that if you can, um, if you have more uh, qubits, you can significantly reduce the number of these specific difficult operations. And that was a big breakthrough. Uh, it was a funny breakthrough because they said we need more qubits, but it's actually really good, right? It's uh, it's it's really confusing. So there is a lot of progress there. How much, how much you can optimize this? I, I'm not sure, uh, but. Uh, uh, this is the whole topic of, um, of, of resource estimation. Uh, it is improving. So on the one hand, the computers are getting better. Um, but on the other hand, the requirements that you need become lower, and eventually you will meet in the middle. Where in the middle? I don't know. 
error correction is where the money is. Uh, I showed you the, um, the publication from Google that showed error correction for the first time, um, really on a small level. This will really have to improve. So we saw there were like tens of qubits that make uh, one logical qubit. We're talking about millions. Um, so showing that it works on a small scale doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work on a large scale. A lot, a lot needs to happen there. Uh, and you know, again, prediction. Um, I think that in the next couple of years, we'll see a lot of um, interesting and even spectacular results on that one. Uh, so if you are waiting for this whole thing to happen, when you see the demonstration of a, a logical qubit that is uh, with you know, really good um, uh, low um, noise level that is made of one, I don't know, 100,000 qubits, that is a really important milestone. So really something to, uh, to, to look for. And then on the arch architecture layer, there's a lot to say there. Um, we are still waiting to find the, the, the kind of funny way to say that the quantum silicon Silicon is a quantum device, so that's a, maybe a bad analogy, but the, the silicon equivalent uh, for quantum. Um, and we will see if that happens. It might even be that for specific applications, uh, ions are going to be better, and to um, run Scholl's algorithm, you need a different type of qubit. We don't know. And this is also something that um, as we go along and we see different modalities improving, um, maybe we will converge to one of them, maybe we won't. Um, I would say that um, I wouldn't be afraid of Schwartz algorithm as long as this is a really open question. So another milestone that, uh, uh, that we need to, uh, to, to wait for. So this is, this is the model. Um, I hope that next time that you see something on LinkedIn, uh, this big announcement uh, with some explanation, because some of them don't even give that, uh, then you could Related to this and say, wait a second, but uh, maybe on the algorithm layer it's, uh, it makes sense, but uh, can they even do error correction? Stuff like that. So um, I hope if I'm successful in any way in this presentation, uh, then you will think about this next time you see some, an announcement like this and maybe make a bit more sense of this. And before I finish, I will just leave you with two, uh, like my take takes from this. We are obsessed about the number of qubits. Every time, uh, like the announcement last week with 1,000 qubits, I got a lot of messages. Is this a big improvement? Um, and even in the paper that they announced it, they said more qubits is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily an improvement. People don't read that. They just see 1,000 qubits. So please stop obsessing about the uh, number of qubits. Um, and then the last thing is we are just at the beginning. This is going to take time. Next time you see a big announcement, before you run quickly to shut down your TLS and everything because it's not, uh, it doesn't work anymore, take a deep breath. My prediction, this is going to take quite some time. Thank you. Thank you, Etan. Um, a fascinating presentation. Um, we've got a couple of questions online. Uh, the first is, um, thinking about the genius Peter Shaw, what sandwich would he have chosen? I'm joking. Um, you, should, you should definitely watch his videos on, uh, on YouTube. He's, uh, he's very smart. Uh, he's also very interesting and has a very interesting voice. So just to, uh, to answer on the same level. The first serious question is, in terms of how long it will take to get a quantum computer that can break RSA slash ECC, what big leaps forward will give us an indication of significant progress for us to worry about? For example, decoherence and fault toler tolerance as opposed to volume of qubits. So will that reduce the thousand to one, etc.? Yes. First of all, I expect the first question to be, oh, but this is only about RSA, so what about ECC? So remember the, the translation between period findings and, and, uh, um, and the factorization problem. There is an, uh, the same thing with, uh, uh, with the discrete logarithm problem, which is um, 
mind-blowing to me that these two problems are connected in, in, in such a way. So it's as a problem for uh, ECC as it is for RSA. To answer this question, like what are the milestones that we expect to, uh, to see? Um, again, on these levels. So one thing was to reduce the, um, uh, the ratio between physical and logical qubits. If you make these physical qubits a little bit more stable, you need less physical qubits to make a logical qubit to get to the same error level. So this is a really important one. As I said, from the, from the second layer, the logical layer, if your resource estimation, you find smart ways to need less resources, that's great. Then from the third and fourth layer, um, I think that error correction is going to be uh, is going to be really important. I'm, by the way, I'm I'm a physicist. I did my PhD here in Amsterdam uh, on a, an extremely difficult experiment. When I started, I was uh, I thought to myself, what am I getting myself into? This will never work, uh, and it does. We we find smart ways to overcome problems. It's 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 incredible. When I think about my impossible ex experiment uh, here at the university and compare it to, uh, to something like this, again, it looks insane to me, but we keep on making progress. So error correction is going to be a really important one. Um, and there are a lot of small details in, uh, there is the stability of qubits and there is uh, error rates uh, of single gate operations and, and two qubit operations. So you can really dive into this uh, very deep. I don't expect anyone uh, without a physics background to, to do that. Um, so I would keep it to error correction, uh, and then I would say the modality. So the, whether it's, it's, uh, it's an ion qubit or a superconducting qubit, when we understand a little bit more which ones are uh, generally better, uh, these will be the milestones that uh, will make us a little bit more worried. Thank you, Itam. Um, we have come to time. We need to move on. Uh, and thank you to Itam. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.